so clearly this is a crowd that gets what it means to think about community and think outside the box about that relationship between citizens and our government. So now what I want to do is ask us to think way outside the box to places like Brazil and Mongolia and Somalia for examples of good local governance. So what can we here in Somerville learn from developing countries, emerging economies, and even failing states? A friend of mine in Ethiopia um, works on this relationship, this social contract between citizens and their government. And he says that good governance helps you do things and is not threatened by ideas. Bad governance just undoes everything you worked your ass off for. So what I'm going to do today is take us on a little trip. We're going to spin the globe to look in on a couple of examples of good local governance um, and see what we can learn. So first stop is Brazil. A really exciting initiative that Brazil is spearheading with the support of the US is catching on like wildfire in a lot of places. This is something where the US and, and Brazil are challenging countries around the world to really think about the commitments that they can make related to how to empower citizens, how to promote transparency more, and how to harness new technologies to really work on that good governance. This partnership is called the Open Government Partnership. And I said it's catching on like wildfire. Already eight countries have made major commitments and another 43 are working on theirs, finalizing them this year. And Part of the reason why I think this is so popular with developing countries and emerging economies is because it's really authentic. It's being led by the global south, by countries like Brazil. So there's that positive peer-to-peer -peer pressure. So in Brazil, their specific commitments focus on participatory budgeting so that you don't just make your, your budgets public as government, but you actually engage citizens in identifying priorities, in negotiating agreements, all of those different things. So in Brazil, one of the, the ways that they're implementing this is tackling the issues of the really crowded favelas. So places where there are major environmental issues, major urban planning issues. So how do you do this? You put GPS units in the hands of residents of the favelas and they map the issues that they know most about. And then they take that data and their ideas back to urban planners and financial managers, and they work together to create policies that are a whole lot more equitable. So next we're gonna go to Mongolia. In 2010, I was there, and they were conducting their national census at the same time that the US was conducting ours. And um, now this is a country of fewer than three million people spread out over 600,000 square miles. And where our census took months and months, their census took a week. So in one of these towns in um, southern Mongolia in a, in a province called Ngobi, a really creative opportunity came up when a group of government officials realized they had an unused public building on public land that they were not going to use anytime soon. And they said, you know what? Civic organizations could really use this space. So they donated it with no strings attached, no expectations. And the goodwill that this very unexpected gift created really meant that civic organizations were more likely to invite government officials into their meetings. And that led to an organic process where they were collaborating on major issues that had really stumped the communities for a long time things like education reform or access to public health services. And this has been replicated in a number of other regions within the country and even private businesses donating land because they realize that these spaces are becoming innovation hubs that benefit every sector within the community. Finally, we're going to go to Somalia. So what can the quintessential failed state possibly teach Somerville? Clearly a lot of um, cautionary tales on the national level, but in a tiny village in the northern region of Somaliland, I was really amazed by what I saw. This is an area where if you were gonna walk to a clinic, it would be several hours walk across an area with known landmines. 
everyone is involved with subsistence farming and literacy can only be described as low. But when there's a decision to be made in this community, the whole community gathers. So something like where to dig a new well. And the right to be the first speaker is always reserved for the person who the community all agrees is the most marginalized relevant to that issue. So in the case that I saw, it was this elderly woman who walks with a crutch. And I was told that because a number of her sons and daughters had died from disease or from um, conflict, that she was also the sole caregiver for 11 grandchildren. So in this particular community, where water was a major issue, the person who was disabled, a female head of household, and a senior had the most status in the community. And when the community gathered and she was speaking, no one else even tried to speak until she was done, because what she was doing was giving the community a baseline for their decision-making process. And I asked the community elders about what this, what this meant. Why, why were they doing this? And they said, yeah, everybody else thinks we're crazy for doing it this way. But what we realized was that we were wasting a lot of resources and we were doing more harm than good for the people we were meant to help by having to undo decisions over and over again. So what does all this mean for Somerville? I'd argue a whole lot. As Americans, our posture to the world is often that we have a lot to offer, and that's totally true. We've heard some really inspiring things today. I'd also argue that we have a lot to learn to keep our economies creative, our communities sustainable. So the lesson I take from Somalia is to be absolutely dogged about, just relentless about inclusion in public decision making. How can we make sure that the new diaspora communities and the people who've had homes foreclosed, how can we make sure that those people are the ones who are getting the first say in how we make decisions? And from Mongolia, the lesson I take is how can we leverage the best that government, that private sector, that civic groups have to offer to create win-win-win opportunities in our communities? And if this open government thing works in places like Brazil, why not adapt it to the local level, to the city level? What would an open government commitment for Somerville look like? And could we make one out of something that we've heard here today? There are over 50 nationalities represented here in Somerville. And what are the other great ideas that are lurking out there if we only look? Thank you very much.